every time we do leadership community, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that we do it is, um, is to bring leaders together, but also to give you guys some leadership input as you're leading, because all of you guys are involved in some leadership capacity here at church. And it's interesting, I was, um, I, I was either reading an article or watching something, I forget exactly where I saw it, but um, it came up recently that somebody was talking about how naturally if people are good with things, they get promoted to working with people. Like, for example, this happens all the time. If you think about it in business places, you know, someone's a good engineer, right? So they, they do a good job as an engineer. And because they're such a good engineer, management looks and goes, why don't we put them over the team of engineers? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It happens all the time. If you're good with things, you often get promoted to working with people. But how many people know that working with people is completely different to working with things? <laughs> Things, things generally, unless they're demonic computers, or printers, like for me, printers, garden appliances, photocopiers are easily demonically possessed, I've decided. These, these are things that just get demons easily, right? But, you know, uh, but the fact is that when you're working with things, it's kind of, it's, it's, people are just like a whole different kettle of fish. And so for all of us, and, and for all of you guys as leaders, we want to be able to equip you because... The fact is, you're not just dealing with things, you're dealing with people. And in order to be an effective leader, we have to know how to be able to work with people. And it's more than just being able to do a job well. If you're going to lead a team of people, you've got to, you've got to know how to motivate them, how to encourage them, how to get behind them, you know, and, the, and, and to, to um, inspire them and, and, and all of these sorts of things, which for some people come very naturally, but for other people, it can be learned. But that's one reason as to why every single time we do leadership community, we're always going to have some leadership input because we want to make sure that you guys are equipped in the various areas that you're in to be able to really lead well and lead people well. So tonight, I want to talk about one of the most important questions that we could ask as leaders. Where's the little clicker? Can I grab that? One of the most important questions that we could ask as leaders, and it's the question, why? Why? How many people have seen the Simon Sinek um, TED Talk or seen any of his stuff? Give me a wave if you have. Okay, only a few. This is good because then it's going to be new for all the rest of you. And I can, <laughs> I can, I can claim this as my own, but I'm going, to give, I'm going to give credit where credit is due because he's actually uh, one of the very first to kind of really articulate this in a brilliant way. And to be honest, if you want to, you can jump online later tonight and, and you can have a look at some of his stuff. It's really good. But the question why? And um, I'm just going to start with this particular Bible verse, which is a completely random one. I almost guarantee you've never heard a preaching or a teaching on this. But uh, I'll start with this. And it's from Exodus chapter 13. And it says this. You must redeem every firstborn donkey with a lamb. And if you do not redeem it, you are to break its neck. Yeah. And every firstborn of your sons, you must redeem. It doesn't obviously say if you don't redeem them, you have to break them. <laughs> I noticed that there was an omission there in the Bible. I'm not sure about that. But in the future, when your son asks you, what does this mean? You are to tell him with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord my first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. Now you can imagine young Jewish children growing up and they're watching, they're, kind of, they're quite normal parents who are, you know, lovely in every other respect of the word. And then from time to time, they're doing particular things that would, to their minds, their young minds, seem very, very odd. It's like, you've got this perfectly good donkey and you're going to go and break its neck. What? Why? And, you know, what is interesting to me, and I'm not really going to get into the whole kind of Old Testament background and sacrificial system and everything tonight. That's, that's for another time. But, <laughs> yeah, I know, sorry. You know. But the, the fact is, though, there are lots of things that we do, and even things that we do as a church, that if you look at them in isolation, you could look and you go, why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. You know, that, that, that seems like a strange thing for you to be doing. And if you look at it just in isolation, you could be left with that kind of, well, why are we doing this? And it's interesting to me that God made the point to his people, don't just do things, but communicate, and especially to the next generation, to the up-and-coming ones, why are you doing it? Why does this thing that you're doing matter? And so it's interesting, Simon Sinek, maybe in more recent times, has put wrapped words around it, but it wasn't his idea originally, it was actually God's. Yeah, right. That you, They wouldn't just do stuff, 
But they would take the time to explain, particularly to the next generation, why they were doing it. Because when the next generation understood why they were doing it, then they were able to participate with what was going on, as opposed to just kind of observing what was going on. If we don't have a strong why for what we do, then those that we lead will do things because they have to, not because they want to. If we don't communicate a strong why, then the, the teams that we're leading, the people who are involved, they might do stuff, but they'll do it because you as a leader are saying you need to do this. They'll do it because they have to. But if you can communicate why you're doing it, if they can buy into the why, then they shift from doing it because they have to to doing it because they want to. And how many know we want teams of people doing stuff because they want to, not because they have to? So if we're going to get there, we've got to understand the power of answering the question why. Now, last leadership community, I talked about thriving under pressure. How many of you guys were here for that? Quite a few. And, you know, one of the things that we looked at is if, if we lose connection with our whys, then our what's we, what we do can start to dry up pretty fast. If you start losing focus on the reason why you're doing something, the big picture, then after a while, you, you'll still do it, but it gets harder and harder to keep doing it if you've lost focus with kind of the, the bigger picture. And so for us as leaders, communicating not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it is one of our most vital responsibilities, and it has some really, really practical applications. I want you to consider for a moment the, the guy or the girl that stands out on Sunday morning in the car park waving to people, in the high-vis jacket, waving to people as they come in to church on a Sunday. Now, if it's a fine day and it's sunny outside and it's all good and that person hasn't had much going on over the weekend and they're a naturally kind of extroverted person, then it's not a bad gig. Getting to stand outside in the sun, waving at people as they come in. You know what? I've done it for daughters' events. I often get that job when Anika runs daughters' events. And I actually quite enjoy it. You know, like it's, it's, it's not a bad gig. But if it's cold and a bit wet and they've come off the back of a really flat-out weekend and then they come to do it and then, um, you know, they wake up on Sunday morning and they look out at the weather outside and they're thinking... <laughs> Why am I doing this? You know, it's, if they don't have a bigger picture to connect that with, then it's going to be really easy for them to just text Lyle or Marchand or whoever and just say, oh, sorry, um, you know, can't make it in today. You know, because they're only looking at the what and they're not seeing the bigger picture of the why. But if you, if you contrast that with a person who really gets the point that every single person who comes into this building is going to come through that car park, and that person is the very first line of connection for anyone who comes, and not just for the regular people, but they understand, particularly for a new person. You see, we don't realise this, but how hard is it for a new person to actually walk into our church? Massively difficult. Like, you know, for, for someone who's never been to church before, for them to drive to our church, get out of their car, walk up the driveway and walk into a building full of people that they don't know, that is like a, that, that's a huge thing for them to do. You know, and yet people do it all the time. It's incredible. But if that person understands that by them standing there, that they are the first person in that line of connection that goes all the way from that person then coming into the building, being part of a worship time, maybe hearing a message, giving an opportunity for them to give their life to Jesus. And if that person realises that they're not just standing there in a car park and just waving at people, but they're part of a bigger picture, then suddenly they're, they're, not, just, they're not just doing something because they have to, they're doing it because they want to, because they see the bigger picture. They've got the why. They understand the why. And friends, I'm not just you know, being kind of you know, funny with, with titles here. You know, uh, I used to work as a petrol, petrol pumper, you know, and I referred to myself as a petroleum transfer agent <laughs> or a petroleum insertion technician. You know. You know, I mean, you know, there's ways of dressing things up, right? But I'm not saying, I'm not talking about just dressing something up. I'm talking about every single person and all of our teams understanding why it is that what they do matters and be able to see it and connect it. Because if they can understand that, then, you know, it actually means then that the, the contribution of the stuff that they're doing, they, they, they see it in terms of the bigger picture. And, and they move from, I have to do this, to, man, I want to do this. You know, I know for so many of us, you know, when you get this, and I know that so many of you guys have got this, you don't, suddenly you don't care where you serve in church anymore. 
when you actually get this. Because you realise that you don't have to be up on stage in order to make an imp impact. You can, you can make an impact anywhere. Like, I mean, to be honest, you know, I'd be happy to, to serve in River Kids. I'd be happy to serve coffee on the morning. I'd be happy to go, yes, yeah. <laughs> She's like, yes, take him. But, you know, because the fact is, I understand. Look, the, the fact is this. I understand this. That if I'm serving in River Kids, I'm not just looking after kids in the morning. I'm releasing their parents for the opportunity for them to be able to connect with God. You see, that's the why. That's the bigger picture. If I'm on the coffee machine, I'm not just serving people coffee. I'm facilitating connections in the church that will enable people, this church, to actually feel like it's more one. You see, it's just about seeing that bigger picture. Are you getting me? Yes. So you can see why this, is, this stuff is important. I'll tell you what, even when it comes to the car park thing, I had an experience with this just recently. I, I went to a seminar at another church. And you guys would all know this church. It's a very well-known church. But I went during the week where they didn't have all the car park attendants and everyone out, right? And I went to the seminar. I spent five minutes run, wandering around the building trying to work out how to get in. I had no idea how to get into this building. I mean, and I found myself up the back, you know, with, with these, you know, <laughs> kind of, you know, garbage bins and everything. I'm like, I'm, I'm definitely in the wrong place here, you know. And, and honestly, I walked around. This, I eventually found myself the way in. But you know what? It crossed my mind. I paid for that seminar. I was going to go. But it crossed my mind as I was trying to find my way into the building. Maybe I'll just get in my car and go home. I mean, I paid to go. You know what would have made all the difference? One person standing there in a high-vis jacket waving and said, hey, this is the way to the front door. Could have made the, you know, so it just really demonstrated to me, you know, sometimes the things that we think, oh, you know, that's not, every single part Everything that you guys do, everything that we are all involved in together helps us, you know, get to where it is that God's calling us to go. So it all, it all matters. It all fits into a bigger picture. So it's important to know what to do, but it's even more important for us to know why we're doing it and how it fits into that bigger picture. So tonight, here's what I want us to challenge us to do. Number one is to know your whys. You guys are leaders. Why is it that you're doing what you're doing in the church? Why is it that you're doing what you... And this doesn't even just apply to church. This applies to every area of your life. Your work life, your family life, your personal life. Every part of your life. Why, what are the motivating factors for you doing what you're doing? Um, you know, at the, you know, need to know your whys because that's where you get your strength from, especially where it starts to get tough, is you go back to your whys. I wonder what your whys are for you, for your area. For the, for the place that God's got you. You know, but how about your teams or the people that you oversee? You know, are they there because of outward pressure or are they there because of inward conviction? You know, we want it to be that everyone here serving at church is not there because of outward pressure. They're there because of inward conviction. And the way that we get there is we become very, very clear about our whys. We talk about it. You know, I, you know, I, I was thinking about this for myself. And for me, and I reckon all of our whys are, are, are different, and that's okay. You don't have to have the same whys as everybody else. But you have to know what your ones are. And I was thinking about this for me in terms of my role and what I do. What are my whys? Why, why, do, why do I do this? Why does this matter for me? And it came down for me for four things. This is just me personally. Number one, and, and these, these are ranked in order from probably least to most important or least kind of powerful to most powerful for me. My least powerful motivating factor, but something that's important for me, is the value of commitment. That's a personal thing. I'm a committed guy. I'm into commitment. And that means, for me, if I make a commitment, then I say that I'm going to do something, then I'm there. And I do it. And I feel really, really bad if I've said I'm going to do something and I don't do it. And to be honest, too, I mean, I struggle. <laughs> I struggle with people who struggle with commitment. <laughs> I really do. That's me being brutally honest because when something is a big value for you and if, if somebody else, you know, and I'm seeing, and I know there's other commitment people, I'm seeing you nodding your head, yes. Preach it, Pete. <laughs> but, you know, the, the fact is, though, um, you know, like I really believe and, you know, you, you, you make a commitment to something, you keep your word. You know, um, the Bible talks about keeping your oath even when it hurts. You know, and that really speaks to me. And you know, there's been times where things have been incredibly tough and I've wanted to give up on stuff. And you know, the reason I haven't given up on it, fundamentally, is because I said I would do it. And so for me, commitment has actually been a motivating factor. It's a low one, it's right down the bottom, but it's still there for me. It's like it's, you know, that, that's been one. 
The second one, for me, slightly higher up, is testimonies and prophetic words. The fact is that um, as I've continued to do what it is that God's called me to do, there's been some results and I've seen some testimonies come out of it and those things have encouraged me. I've also had prophetic people come and say to me from time to time, hey, this is what God is saying over your life. And when I've tapped into that, it's, you know, I've lined that stuff up and I've tried to live my life along those lines. And so that's been a motivating factor as well. So when things get hard, I go back to my prophetic words or I go back to the testimonies and I remind myself of that. And that, what that does is that gives me motivation. That's my why. Can you see how that kind of connects? So that's the, that's the second one. But then going up from that, the third one, my second to top one, and this might be interesting for some of you, and it was interesting for me when I actually stumbled on this one is actually a big reality for me, is the reality of eternity. The fact is that eternity is very, very long, and our life here on earth is very, very short. And what we do with this is going to impact that. And the reality of hell and the reality of the fact that a lot of people who don't know Jesus are in great danger of going and spending eternity there. You see, we often don't talk about that in the church, but that's a motivating factor for me. It really is, because, you know, the fact is, I'm saved. I know that if I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. But I live in a community of 250,000 people, the majority of them who don't know Jesus. And you know what? I can't just sit back idly and just, you know, do nothing while all of them are destined for a lost eternity. So for me, that's a motivating factor as well. You know, and so that's a big reason why. I mean, even, even if I wasn't employed by the church, I would still be getting involved because I'd be looking at the reality of eternity and going, man, I've got to get involved here. I've got to do something. You know, so for me, when I think about that, it motivates me. It's like, man, I want to keep doing this because it matters. There is a, that's the why. Can you see the power of the why? But then for me, the, the number one, the one that outweighs all of them, is the fact that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to earth and he died on a cross and he bled out every last bit of his blood to save me from my sins and to give me a life that I never deserved. And not only that, he gives me the air that I breathe. He gives me the gifts and the talents. He's put everything in my life and he has set up my life for good works. How could I not live this life for him? How could I do anything but put him in the highest place in my life and spend my life worshipping him. I mean, how could I do anything else apart from that? That's why I'm fundamentally a worshipper. You know, that's, that's what got me into worship in the first place, was the fact that, you know, the, the goodness of God to me, I don't understand. I do not understand how people can come to church and worship is going on and they're just standing there. I don't get it. It just fundamentally does not register for me because it's like, you know, the moment that I think about all that he has done for me, man, I have to give him everything. He is so worthy. He is so worthy of every last breath that I have. He's, got, he's worthy of everything that I have to give. And so when I think about that, that is my why. You know, the reality of eternity is my why. These are the things that motivate me, that keep me going. And, you know... We can know our whys, but we have to show our whys. Amen? We can know it, but we've got to show it. We've got to talk about it. Because the things that, that motivate you as leaders, if you share those things with your team, guess what? It's going to motivate them as well. You know, even as I'm talking here tonight, I'm talking about personal stuff, right? But as I'm doing it, I'm watching you. And you're sitting there going, yeah, I'm seeing this resonate. Because, you know, when we start talking about our whys, it actually resonates with other people. And if you want to motivate your team and you get them not just doing stuff because they have to, but because they want to, start talking about your whys. Start showing them how what it is that they're doing in the life of the church isn't just about you know, keeping the wheels spinning on this little area, but it's connected to the bigger mission of what we are here to do. Because when they begin to see that, man, then, then it becomes a pleasure to serve. They're not doing it any longer because you're beating them up. They're doing it because they want to. It, it starts coming out of them because they're so excited about what it is that they see. We can focus on the what's, but we don't always get motivated by the what's. You know, some what's are more fun than others. You know, we've got a fun what coming up on Wednesday night. If you're not Jen, the light party is a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to have a lot of fun. It's a great, great event. And if you're not Jen and you're not behind that thing and having to run it, it's, it's awesome. That's a fun one. You know, so some what's are fun, and that's good. 
But you know, and then there's other watts that are a bit harder. Church working bees. <laughs> Hello. Everyone ducks. <laughs> oh, I'm busy. But listen, the, the reason, the, 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 the thing is though, and this is a good thing to remember, if you're leading a team, you're leading a connect group, whatever, the harder the what, the more important the why. The harder the what is, the more important the why you're doing it. So if, if you've got to get your team to do some stuff that's a bit hard, you have to, as a leader, go overboard on the why. You've got, you've got, they've got to see how this hard thing that they're going to do connects with the bigger vision. Because if they can see that, then they'll be on board. And then, you know, you, that, they'll want to be a part of it. You see, often we're doing things as leaders because we do the hard things because we see how they connect with the bigger thing. And we just assume that everybody else knows that. But what we have to learn, though, is we've got to learn how to communicate that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And see, and this is good stuff because this doesn't just work at church, people. Kingdom principles work in your workplace as well. This is a good one. This is a freebie. You can take this and apply this at work as well because it works. So what we're going to do tonight in, these, in this last kind of 20 minutes or so is we're just going to take a bit of moment for reflection. And um, I've got... We are. Um, yeah, one each. Yeah, one each for everyone. We just got a little, um, a little uh, thing here, which has just basically got two questions on it. And the first question is, why are you motivated to do what you do? We're going to connect you with your whys tonight. So we're just going to take a moment. We're going to play a little bit of quiet music if we can. And just going to take maybe about kind of five minutes or so just to fill this out. And then the second thing is, how can you... Um, how can I help those that I lead? What are some ways that I can communicate that to the people that I lead? So we're going to do this individually for a little bit, and then um, around our tables, then we're just going to take some time and share with one another the various whys that we've come up with for ourselves and for our teams. And I'm trusting that this is going to be a really encouraging exercise, not just for you, but also for everyone else at your table tonight. It's going to be really good. So we'll just take, take a bit of time just to go through that now. And... Um, then we'll, uh, we'll share together.